Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I guess this is our first gathering of September. It definitely feels like a, a change in season and the temperature here. Really noticing it. I was <laughs> looking for my fleece lined pants this afternoon and not ready to turn the furnace on yet. But yes, I'm glad you're here. And uh, whenever you're practicing with us, um, happy to happy to be practicing with you uh this week i um was in guelph doing some chores with my daughter and um nearby a certain place that um called the puffle cafe in guelph and uh, i was very excited because they make vietnamese coffee there that's just it's a good thing i don't live closer because that would be a problem. Uh, fabulous, fabulous coffee. And um, so that was a real treat. They also make amazing Vietnamese desserts and things, crepes. But uh, so Puffle Cafe in Guelph, little plug. And uh, as we were, we were just getting takeout. Uh, and as he was making my coffee, the owner who um, also runs the shop and I think it's his wife does the baking uh, he was kind of apologizing for how long it takes because it's a it's a, a particular process it's it's not that slow but I guess it's a, a slow brew um, it's a small little cup with the grounds in it that he has to keep topping up with water and it it finely ground so it goes through slowly and stuff and um I I said no problem because to me that's part of the experience of it that it that makes it taste so good part of it is the waiting for it but also just appreciating the way it's done that makes it taste amazing everybody's going to be craving coffee after this <laughs> uh if you like coffee that is but he was saying how a fair number of his uh, customers, I guess, at work in that area kind of co complain about it. They want that coffee, but they don't want to wait for the process. And they so they order it ahead and then pop in to grab it and or they're. Yeah. And so he talked about all these different ways he's tried to make it faster. Um, so we're just talking about Vietnamese coffee and that process of making it for folks and um so he talked about these ways of trying to make it faster and using other machines and other grinds and stuff but it just didn't taste as good as this slower process um and so then uh, as we're chatting as it slowly drips um he asked me if i'd heard about the hurry up and wait syndrome of course, I've heard this phrase, hurry up and wait before, but um, the way he described it, and then he said, you know, there was a Harvard study. <laughs> There's a Harvard study for everything, right? It's like, how many times have I said that myself or heard it, Harvard study? But I couldn't actually find one. I think it was a, all I could find was an article in a Harvard Business Review. I don't think there was, a, as far as I can find, um, a hurry up and wait syndrome study. Uh, it's it. Then he proceeded to ask me these four questions. It sounds like somebody wrote a cute article about it. I couldn't find the four questions online, but I remembered him the questions as he asked them to me. Uh, and and it was around a kind of self diagnosing if you have the hurry up um, and wait syndrome. So you can check these out for yourself as I uh, recall them. So the first question is, in, 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 when you're driving, if you're driving um, and you're approaching an intersection, a red light, and there's several lanes of cars, do you, at a, at a red light, do you find yourself jockeying for the shortest line? Do you make a point of like assessing it and then try to get to the shortest line? That's the first question. Uh, the second uh, was around multitasking. Do you notice, do you find yourself, do you have a tendency to multitask through the day? 
The third question is similar to the driving one, like at the grocery store, are you maneuvering for the fastest lane, fastest line of people in cars? Do you like assessing how much do they have? You know, are they distracted by kids? Do they, do they just have a few big items? It's not just the length of the line, but how much is in there? And you're like trying to get to the fastest line. <laughs> And then you think you have the fastest line and then this somebody says, oh, can you do a price check on this? And you're like, oh, I've got the wrong line. <laughs> so that's number three. The fourth question he asked me was um, when you're you know, out, out and about and you meet an acquaintance um, who asks, how are you? And in your reply, how often do you say, I'm busy? you know, or I'm busy, but, or this and that, it's kind of busy, you know, how often is that part of your description of how life is for you? Yeah, so, um, and then there's actually a cardiologist who wrote a book called The Hurrying Sickness, and how this type of lifestyle of constantly feeling rushed, feeling hurried, feeling an urgency to most things that you're doing um, is correlated with type A personality and stress-related heart disease and hypertension. And then it may show up as fatigue and headaches and low immune system, et cetera. So it's not just a, not it's not just a habit or a way of doing things. It has mental and physiological effects. Uh, and it reminded me of a sutta, as, as is the way, um, called the flood. Um, it, this is in the, it's SN 1.1. If you're interested in following the suttas, I'll put the link down below. It's a Samyutta Nikaya 1.1. And it's very short, and uh, it's translated as being called the flood. It's um, the Oga Tarana Sutta. Oga means flood. And I have two versions of translations of it here, one from Tanisaro Bhikkhu and the other um, Bhikkhu Nandananda. They're, of course, with translations, they're always a little bit different, so I'm kind of cross-referencing and uh, looked up a few things myself. So there's a, in, in this story, in this case, it's a deva, like a divine being comes to the Buddha and asks, how did you cross the floods, cross over, um, how you crossed over the flood, um, how did you cross the flood, yes, just looking at both these translations. So the flood here is re referring to the worldly flood of craving the, the our our constant conditioned feeling swamped by flooded by desire and craving and the the buddha upon awakening is said to have crossed crossed over crossed through that flood <clears throat> And so the Buddha replies, um, I crossed over the flood without pushing forward or without hurrying and without staying in place. Uh, other translations say tarrying, like staying in place. Um, another translation of hurrying is straining. So without pushing forward, without straining, without hurrying, because <clears throat> when we push through life, strain against life, uh, we get swept away. Um, we uh, One of the translations said, he, he goes on to describe, when I pushed forward, I was whirled about or um, where is the other one? Uh, da, da, da. World about, oh, and the other one says swept away. So yeah, you can picture 
maybe a very fast running river, a flooded area. Oh. Yeah, just the waves of grief there at our uh, at the floods that are happening and the thousands of deaths from the environmental catastrophe. So this in this metaphor of crossing a flood, um, when one hurries through life, when one hurries on this path and pushes and strains, then there's a lack of mindfulness, a lack of steadiness, and we get swept away into the floods of, of craving. And likewise, or conversely, he says, and I crossed over the flood um, without staying in place. Like I had have to keep a steady, steady pace. Um, when when I tarried, I sank. So when if he if he stayed in place, he would just sink into lack of forward leading, onward leading awareness. <clears throat> and uh, and then it goes on. And so, friend, untarrying or without stopping. And without hurrying, unhurrying, did I cross the flood. And this points to the middle way. Not hurrying and not standing still, but keeping a steady progress, a mindful, um, concentrated in some cases, unstrained steadiness in our path. <clears throat> It kind of, the sutta ends with a, a little verse, a kind of the kind of a poetic verse, and uh, these ones are kind of different. But um, the the person speaking with the being speaking with the Buddha says, um, "At long last, I see a Brahmin." totally unbound, so he's he's free, unbound, who without pushing forward, without staying in place, has crossed over the entanglements of the world. The other one says the world's viscosity, which is a good word, like the, the thickness, the stickiness of craving, the entanglements has crossed through them. And, and of course, this teaching is about much more than just, you know, are we hurrying through our lives? Are we not being patient while we wait for Viet Vietnamese coffee to be slowly brewed? But uh, is, so it's not just about the mundane hurrying or stagnation. And yet, <laughs> I think they're related, they're relevant. Is that is that a tendency? Do you always feel a sense of urgency or anxiety or mm, rushed energy or is the opposite part of um, what you need to be counterbalancing kind of a sloth and torpor or a dullness a lack of energy a lack of uh, consistent uh, commitment of course we can hear that this is related in some ways to the five hindrances that hinder what what why are they called the hindrances they hinder awakening they hinder mindfulness so desire and aversion are two of them which are all through this teaching but also and and then the next are restlessness so that kind of energy of push 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 agitation and the and the opposite of that torpor, sloth and torpor, this dullness, this lack, this standing still energy that will cause us to sink. And uh, and then the fifth hindrance is doubt. <clears throat> and uh, so it's really a, a teaching, a, a, a reminder 
of crossing through the floods of the middle path and uh, to to check, you know, what is my commitment to practice? Is there is there a steadiness or is there kind of a times of push and then times of of uh, dropping away? Um, and or are we pushing so much and trying to hurry through that um, we're missing the steadiness and the depth and the uh, breadth of awareness? I find this can even happen right like in our practice in in general, in our life, in our in our daily energies. Um, but also like within a meditation practice. Mm, some people mm, try to to get somewhere too quickly, <laughs> like just in in one meditation session. I've I've been thought, personally find it very beneficial to take a good chunk of time, at least five minutes to just arrive, just meeting the body and relaxing, slowing down, noticing any tensions, feeling the sensations of the ground or temperature or texture, just landing in the body. And then I often just let my mind run around because it's so used to running around all day long. Da, da, da. And I just let it the body becomes still and the mind is still pinging around thinking of the what's next and to-do lists and this and that and opinions and judgments and all the all of the everything's and i just uh let it go for a while run around until it pretty soon gets very boring <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, just settle down, honey, come on. Like, it, you know, we've just listened to myself chattering about all the nonsense. And then it's, you just want to rest. I, that's what I'm describing what I feel in myself is I just want to just settle down. It's okay. Come and rest. It's, it feels to me like training a puppy. Like, I just let it run around, run around, run around or toddler <laughs> run around and then it's like come and come and sit come and sit and uh, so that I'm not trying to rein in the mind or the body like pay attention to the breath get on the breath stay on the breath I mean that's not the practice anyways but so really a, a slow and steady meeting of ourselves, landing, arriving, relaxing the nervous system, let the mind biff around for a bit, and then like, oh, come on, that's enough. I've, I've heard enough of that chatter. Come and rest on this breath, or whatever anchor you're using, sound, sensation, metaphrases. You know, we have many, many practices we could do, but breath is kind of a very common one. Um, yeah, so that might be helpful for you just to notice, is there a tendency for you to like, you start your practice and you're like, all right, let's get on it. And just, uh, that is kind of, that's kind of a hurry up and wait way to practice <laughs> and, um, see what it's like. Is it helpful to really come at, into it slowly, let the system calm down. And then when you when you really feel like, oh, I just want to rest the mind and heart and body, then it's not a push-pull. There is less resistance and there's um I, that's how it works for me anyways. So yeah. I think that's it. So let's practice crossing the flood together. <clears throat> so adjust anything you need in your space.
Finding a posture that's conducive to this balance of energy of wakefulness without overly striving. So we want to have a support, whether we're standing or reclining, uh, that helps us to be wakeful and upright and relaxed. And notice if you um, hurry, if there feels there's any kind of hurry to close your eyes or get into your meditative posture, is it helpful for you to do some movement or touch or looking around your space? Any other adjustments you need so that when you come to stillness, it really feels uh, like you're not imposing that it's just um, really supportive invitation to come into stillness the eyes can close or rest downward or rest in soft gaze on something supportive and peaceful And I'm just remembering one of my teachers, Michael Stone, saying partway through a meditation to notice if we were trying to meditate and, uh, you know, to just drop that. And so see if, if you're already pushing to start a meditation and just, just meet yourself in your posture. Begin to really gently feel sensations on the skin and the muscles. Noticing any of these habit tensions we've picked up through our day from hurrying up or from multitasking or busyness. Where does that kind of energy show up in your body? Is it in your eyes, the jaw? What's happening in the area of the neck and shoulders? Softening through the heart center and the belly center. Relaxing hands. And as the upper body relaxes, feeling the weight and groundedness, 
through legs and feet. If this is your first practice of the day, it may be the first time you've stopped to just notice the sensations of the body. Unless there's been pain or something really grabbing attention. So just be here meeting yourself. And then for these next several minutes, if you want, you could try this on to just let the mind run around. Do what it usually does. You don't even need to be paying attention or being mindful of the mind. You're just sitting or reclining. And let it, just let it do mind stuff. Remembering and planning and imagining and wanting and not wanting. Let's be quiet together for a few minutes. And if you've got more things that you want to think about and plan about and worry about and argue about, you can just let that go on for another minute or two. When you feel ready to rest the body, heart, mind, so that we can cross the flood, of craving without being swept away and without sinking. Then you can gently choose your anchor, perhaps breath or one of the others mentioned. 
And just invite awareness to rest here. Not pushing. With a very kind, friendly attitude to yourself. Rest on the waves of the breath, rising and passing, step by step, breath by breath, steady. As mindful of each breath as you would be of each step across the currents and rocks. At those times when attention gets swept away or sinks into torpor, gently begin again. This breath, this step across the flood.
Noticing if there's restlessness or pushing or feeling world about. Just steadying, awakening. Or is there sinking, torpor? And we want to wake up a little bit more, bring a bit more energy. And can we keep that steady awakeness without tension? If awareness is resting with the anchor of the breath, notice at which part of the breath does awareness tend to slip away or sink into sloth and torpor. Is it at the end of the exhale, the beginning of the inhale, at the top of the inhale or the length of the exhale, awakening to each part, each moment, each step without tension.
Mm. I'll put the link to the sutta down below and um, yeah, I didn't find any Harvard study, so I won't put a link to that, but uh, I think we get the idea to, to notice if there's much hurry up and wait energy in your in your life habit and uh, our practice is a wonderful place to cultivate um, some skillfulness with that that uh, can affect all, all that we do and help us cross the floods so thank you for joining the practice <laughs>